When it comes to technology and its involvement with individual liberty, the tech is often seen as something that the government uses to suppress people. However, technology is not something which is inherently good or evil. It is neutral. And like anything else in life, technology doesn't become evil until it is put into the hands of people, since humans are the only ones really capable of evil. But as recent decades have shown us, technology has been used by governments and corporations to gain more control over the people. One example is with the evolution of money. In the United States, money used to be on the gold standard, meaning that every dollar that you had could be traded in for a certain amount of gold. This gold standard also prevented the US government from printing money at their leisure like they do now. No more money could be created until more gold was found. There was also no central bank in America for most of its history. But then in 1913, the Federal Reserve was created, which, despite its name, is not actually a part of the government. It is a privately owned corporation that is unaudited and prints money when it sees fit to loan it out to banks with an interest rate, and then adjusts this interest rate up and down depending on how well the economy is doing. Now initially, the Federal Reserve was loosely held to the gold standard, as they were required to hold gold equal to 40% of the value of the currency that it was issuing, and it had to convert dollars into gold at a fixed price of $20.67 per ounce. But by 1971, even these standards were removed, and the dollar became completely fiat. Not long after that, debit cards came into the scene, followed by more forms of electronic payment, which gave way to the situation that we have today. Fiat currency that is backed by nothing but the promise of the federal government insisting that it has valued, and then it is issued electronically into bank accounts that you don't even really control since the bank or the government could freeze or remove your assets whenever they deem it necessary. This money is really just an arbitrary number which can be taken from you at any time. The money situation seemed pretty hopeless until the invention of cryptocurrency. This new form of currency is completely decentralized from any banks or federal government. It is not fiat, meaning that more of the currency cannot be arbitrarily issued or directly devalued by the government like the US dollar. It is more divisible and harder to counterfeit than both fiat currency and gold. Crypto wallets can also be created through Tor and kept offline, making their creation anonymous, and then you can fund these wallets anonymously through crypto ATMs using cash. Now, the first cryptos that became popular were not anonymous because anyone could see the balance and the transactions that were made by any wallet. So it really just became a matter of pairing up a wallet to a person which is pretty easy considering that most crypto exchange sites want your personal details in order for you to create a wallet. But now that Monero is even more popular than ever, the previous prospects of tracing are going away since Monero uses ring signatures and stealth addresses to hide the identities of the sender and the receiver, as well as ring confidential transactions to hide the transaction amounts. So at first, technology like the debit card initially devalued our money and gave governments more control over it, but cryptocurrencies have all but reversed that. In fact, the only thing that's really keeping it from becoming the new standard of currency is misinformation campaigns about the legitimacy and efficacy of cryptocurrencies, as well as confusion in the public about how cryptocurrencies work, which is also largely related to the misinformation campaigns. The next example we'll look at is communications. Technology has revolutionized communications over time. Originally, humans had to communicate in person, which is very limited because, well, it requires everybody to show up in person. And it's also very easy to oppress this kind of speech. If a government doesn't like the speech that a public gathering is having or that the people are engaging in, they can usually identify the people, prosecute them, or disrupt their speech with noise, tear gas, water cannons, or riot squads, or just flat out make public gatherings illegal to discourage people from engaging in them in the first place. Now, most communications are done online, but most forms are still easily controlled by a corrupt government. 
A perfect example would be the Chinese government censoring WeChat, a popular chat application in China. If you attempt to have a conversation or send images that the Chinese government doesn't approve of, then these will be censored. These mass communications are also facilitated by major corporations. In the WeChat example, they are owned by Tencent, a Chinese multinational technology conglomerate, which is part of the reason that they are one of the authorized communication apps in China. In America and the rest of the world, we have apps like WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and Twitter, and none of these are much better. These companies have shown countless times that they will ban people by arbitrarily interpreting their terms of service, and there's also the issues of the networks, which are again owned by major corporations, who could in theory deny access to people who they don't want to access these networks. Then there's the issue of cell phones, and of course cellular tracking, which can be used to constantly know your whereabouts, assuming that you keep your cell phone with you at all times, like most people do. And that cell phone can be used to video or audio record you at any moment that a company or any government agency wants to do it in order to spy on you. Now there has been progress in these fields to benefit the people. One example are apps like Signal, which is open source and verifiably sends your messages with end-to-end -end encryption, as well as calls and video chats. So even though the networks that this data is passing through, which are owned by a corporation and, again, could be used to arbitrarily discriminate against you, there is really no way for them to know the contents of the conversation, and thus it makes it harder for them to censor you. On the cell phone front, there are phones that you can root, and routing is becoming more common. And of course, after routing a phone, it's usually possible to install a privacy-centered ROM, such as Graphene OS, which makes it less likely that your cell phone will be turned into a spying device. There are also cell phones that are coming out now that have free and open source, truly free and open source operating systems installed on them by default. On the subject of communications, it's also worth mentioning the sharing of information. So when it comes to sharing information, the old tech way was printing and sharing books. This isn't very effective though, because books can be easily destroyed. It's also difficult to massively distribute them in an anonymous way. So when governments decide to ban books like 1984, the Bible, or Mein Kampf, it can become nearly impossible for somebody that is living under that government to get their hands on one of those books or know what is actually written in them. But with decentralized distribution methods like torrenting, it becomes safe and easy to distribute forbidden knowledge to those who seek it. To wrap up, our freedoms don't mean anything without some way for the people to individually and collectively secure these freedoms. And as history has shown us, the most effective way to do that is with an armed populace. This is why the Founding Fathers originally wrote the Second Amendment into the Constitution. And it was so important, they made it second, since the importance of the right to bear arms is only outweighed by the right to free speech, religious practice, and assembly. For almost 150 years after the creation of the Constitution, the Second Amendment was interpreted as shall not be infringed, meaning that it stood as written. People had the right to bear arms, and this wasn't just limited to guns. This was also including the highest levels of military equipment, since cannons, which fell into this category, were also included. But over the years, this freedom has been restricted. In 1934, the first round of infringements came about with the National Firearms Act, which placed a tax on the manufacturing, selling, and transporting of certain firearms such as short barrel shotguns, rifles, machine guns, and silencers. The tax for these items was, and still is, $200 for each of these items, which sounds a little steep, but then imagine that in 1930s money. Further infringements, like the Gun Control Act of 1968, added restrictions to bombs, mines, and hand grenades, and also deemed importing guns that have a so-called no sporting purpose, and it also required that all manufactured imported guns have a serial number stamped on them to allow the government to more easily track the firearms. 
Some more recent examples are the 1994 assault weapons ban, which made guns that were deemed assault weapons illegal for 10 years, and the 2018 bump stock ban passed by the Trump administration. There's been numerous bans on guns and gun accessories, and it's clear that as gun technology increases, the regulation, tracking, and outright banning of these weapons being owned by civilians does as well. But what if you were to build your own guns? Homemade firearms are virtually impossible to regulate since you aren't actually buying them from anybody. They can't be tracked since they don't have serial numbers unless you decide to print one on the gun yourself. And I want to make this clear that you can technically, but not legally, manufacture the firearms however you want. For example, if you want a machine gun, it could be as easy as modifying the lower receiver with some machining tools, assuming that your firearm comes with a fully automatic bolt carrier. If not, then you'll need one of those as well. There's also the option of adding a wire coat hanger, often called a drop-in auto sear, to accomplish the same thing. Now, originally, these modifications, besides the coat hanger one, had to be made by someone who was very knowledgeable with machining, and also required specialized tools to do so. Still possible for a person to accomplish, but difficult. But now, with the invention of 3D printing, anyone who downloads the blueprints, has the right kind of printer, and polymer, can build their own unregistered firearm to whatever specifications they want. And just like with torrenting music or movies, you can torrent these blueprints, which makes them impossible to regulate or suppress. And of course, these blueprints can be modified in whatever way you want. Full auto, semi-auto, fully semi-automatic, whatever floats your boat. And speaking of boats, there's no longer any need to lose your 3D printed guns in a boating accident because they don't have serial numbers in the first place. They aren't going to be registered anywhere in order for the government to come and take them later. And the 3D printing technology keeps on getting better. I remember almost a decade ago when these printers were first invented, the guns that would be printed, they looked pretty weird. They were kind of bulky and the lower receivers that were used with other AR parts would often break after running a few mags through them. But now it can last hundreds of mags. And that's what the plastic lowers. Metal ones, of course, they're even more durable. So once again, 3D printing technology has put the right to bear arms properly back into the hands of the people, despite government's attempts to suppress it. So in summary, Technology can be used for the advancement of a liberated society or its oppression. It's up to the individuals who control that technology to decide the fate of their society by what those tools are used for.